Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtadar Khan. I'm your host. I'm also your friend. I'm your friend and your host. Today, I'm going to answer all the questions that I have received on askprofkhan at gmail.com. This is a special Conversations. I was absolutely delighted to first receive so many questions and in so many languages. Uh, and let me tell you, the questions are brilliant. Many of them are just unbelievable. Uh, and I will have to do a lot of research uh, and in fact uh, I'll have to think a lot about it uh, to answer the questions. So today I'm going to answer the questions. I'm going to answer five questions and uh, the first uh, three of them are going to be in English and two of them are going to be in Hindi. So so please those of you who only follow English uh, uh, bear with me. I will do some brief translations of the Hindi questions and answers and those of you who only follow Hindi just hang in there I'm sure you'll grasp most of the conversations uh, but before I uh, read the first question uh, please subscribe to conversation like the video and also make sure that later on you share this video with your friend but most importantly do not forget to send questions. Send questions if possible in a video format so I can share the video with you. Send me questions uh, with your photograph. I will share that. Tell me where you are from. That will make the conversation even more interesting. So the first question uh, is very, very interesting. Uh, it is from uh, Alexandra Tripathi. I wonder if this is Alexandra Tripathi Anyway, so Alexandra Tripathi says uh, India's multipolarity, India has been walking the tightrope since it adopted this multipolar approach. As you have discussed in many of your programs, the challenges with this approach have increased exponentially in 2022 when everyone is seeking answers to the allegiance question. My question is as follows. What are the steps or strategies that India can take or adopt to minimize these challenges. Tripathi, thank you very much for your question. I think uh, you misheard me. Uh, multipolarity is a description of the state of the world, in what condition the world is. If there is one country which is really very dominant, as the US was in 1991, then you would call it a unipolar system in which one country is very dominant. Uh, like in social media, Facebook is very dominant uh, or in microblogging, Twitter is very dominant. So in, in microblogging, you have a unipolar system where Twitter dominates. And then if you have two players competing for domination, you have bipolarity. But in, in a system, you have many players, four, five players competing to dominate then you would say it's a multipolar system. So for example, today's cricket team, you have India, you have England, you have Australia. So there are three really good teams which are dominating the system. So you would say it's a system with multipolarity. But the word that you want to use, and I'm going to have it written here, is multi-alignment. The strategy that India has been pursuing is a strategy of multi-alignment. It is the opposite of non-alignment. This is what I was talking uh, on the Khamar Chima show. So under Jawaharlal Nehru, India basically didn't want to align with the superpowers in a bipolar system. They didn't want to be part of the West. They didn't want to be part of the communist world. So India remained non-aligned. It was not taking sides with either side. But today, India wants to be with everybody. India sees the world as a multipolar system in which there is Russia, there is China, there is US, there is Japan, and there is Europe, and there is India. So there are six poles in the world as India sees it. Jai Shankar talks about it uh, quite frequently, and he wrote about it in his book, uh, The India Way. So what is the strategy? India wants to be with everybody, unlike non-alignment with nobody. India wants to be aligned with Russia, aligned with China in the SCO. India wants to be with the US in the Quad. India also wants to develop relations with Europe. So they bought Rafale from France. India is again with Japan in the Quad. So India wants to be with some of the major powers and that is the strategy of multi-alignment. The problem that India faces is when these 
players compete with each other and they demand exclusive alignment. So the US wants India to be aligned with the US and have no relations with India, with China or Russia. In fact, they want India to align with the US against Russia and China. And that is, the chi that is essentially the needle that India is trying to thread. Alexander Tripathi ka sawal hai ke India ki jo strategy hai multi-alignment ki yani kisi pehle to India non-aligned tha kisi ke saath bhi nahi judta tha ab sab ke saath judne ki koshish kar raha hai kya India isko manage kar sakega kyunki dunia mein bahut challenges hai aur mujhe lagta hai ki India abhi tak to manage kar raha tha lekin ab jo America ka demand hai ki India, Russia aur China ke saath na rahe sirf America ke saath jud jaye ना सिर्फ अमेरिका के साथ जुड़े बट अमेरिका के साथ ऐसा जुड़े कि वो रशिया और चाइना के खिलाफ हो अमेरिका के साथ अब देखते हैं हाउ इंडियाज पॉलिसी इवॉल्व द सेकंड क्वेश्चन थैंक यू त्रिपाठी एंड प्लीज सेंड मी मोर क्वेश्चन दिस वाज अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द कोर एस्पेक्ट ऑफ इंडियाज फ्यूचर फॉरेन पॉलिसी द सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज फ्रॉम मितेश देसाई Mitesh says, do you think Europe, Australia and North America have benefited from being away by keeping all conflicts, wars away from their borders and they have been able to invest in research and development, etc. Unlike India, which has fought more than four to five wars and is also a target of terrorism. Mitesh, this is a very good question. In fact, one way to understand this question is to look at how little money Europe has been investing in its defense. Uh, since uh, 1945, there hasn't been any major war uh, in Europe. Of course, there was the Bosnian genocide uh, where the Serbs tried to kill all Muslims in Bosnia. But there hasn't been a major war until now when Russia invaded Ukraine. So Europe has benefited significantly from this peace dividend. Uh, it reduces budget so much that Trump was threatening to withdraw from NATO if they didn't up their budget to 2%. So if you look at say India's defense budget, I think it's more than 3% and other countries often go up to 4% uh, or more when that same money could otherwise be invested in healthcare, in education, etc. So I think if India is able to develop peaceful relations, especially with China and somehow resolve the border issues with Pakistan. I mean, it is wishful thinking, obviously. But if India is able to do that and reduce its defense expenditure, then yes, it will be able to uh, provide better health care, better education, better quality of life to its citizens. And India will start rising on the human development index. The reason why Europe is so high, where people work less than 40 hours a week, have uh, early retirements and great vacations, is partly because they don't spend too much money. The US spends, we spend, we work hard to defend Europe. As you can see, we are outspending Europe in the defense of Ukraine. So you are right, peace, uh, Peace has a great dividend and that can be improved quality of life. Mitesh says that the Western Mumalik has spent a lot of money in the past few years on defense, which is because their quality of life is better because they have education and health care etc. And this is right. India is the security of the security. India is about 3-4% of the defense budget of India. सो तीन इंडिया का थर्ड बिगेस्ट बजट है दुनिया में तक तो मुझे लगता है कि अगर इंडिया के तालुकात चाइना और पाकिस्तान से बेहतर हो जाते हैं और डिफेंस पे इतना खर्च करने की जरूरत नहीं पड़ेगी तो वही जो रकम है एजुकेशन पर हेल्थ केयर पर और क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ पे खर्च किया जा सकता है इसलिए कोशिश की जाती है कि दुनिया में पीस इस्टेब्लिश करें थैंक यू नितेश फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन The next question uh, or next two questions are in Hindi and these are amazing questions. Uh, this question by Ankit Bhagwadi from Uttarkhand. Oh my God, you are a philosopher Ankit. Uh, you should be writing philosophical books. But mashallah, these are really tough questions and I'll try to answer those questions to the best of my ability. Ankit Sahab says, I am Ankit Bhagwadi from Uttarkhand. Se. मैं आपकी बड़ी बड़ी बातों के बहुत सादे अंदाज में कहने के तरीके का कायल हूं और जो उदाहरण आप देते हैं वो बहुत ही रोचक होता है 
भारत और अमेरिका के बीच के रिश्ते को महिला मित्र के रूप में समझाना मिसाल के तौर पे आपने निवेदन आप से निवेदन है कि जो प्रश्न आपको उपयुक्त लगे उसका उत्तर जरूर दें इज नॉट ओनली पोलाइट इज ऑल्सो वेरी हम्बल आपका शुभ चिंतक आपके भारत से तो व्हाट इज द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन अंकित साहब पूछते हैं क्या दुनिया में हमेशा से संस्कृति और मजहब के बीच में एक टकराव रहा है किस प्रकार की व्यवस्था या अच्छा उदाहरण है जिन्होंने धर्म से पहले संस्कृति को चुना बांग्लादेश इंडोनेशिया या तुर्की या जिन्होंने धर्म को मुख्य माना सऊदी अरब और पाकिस्तान दिस इज अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन अंकित कहते हैं कि देर इज टेंशन बिटवीन कल्चर एंड रिलीजन हैज इज ऑलवेज बीन द केस क्या ये हमेशा से ऐसा था कि संस्कृति और मजहब के बीच में टकराव था और ही ऑल्सो वॉन्ट्स नो विच सिस्टम इज बेटर दैट विच प्रिवलेज कल्चर ओवर रिलीजन एंड एग्जाम्पल ही साइड्स ऑफ बांग्लादेश इंडोनेशिया एंड टर्की और दैट वे रिलीजन इज प्रिवलेज ओवर कल्चर सच एज सऊदी एंड पाकिस्तान मुझे लगता है कि संस्कृति यानी कल्चर सभ्यता सिविलाइजेशन ये हिस्टोरिकल प्रोडक्ट है ये तारीख का प्रोडक्ट है इसे वक्त लगा बनने के लिए लेकिन संस्कृति से पहले इंसान था और इंसान के दिल में खौफ और इंसान को जो चीज़ उस वो नहीं समझ सकता है और नहीं जान सकता है ख़ासतौर से फ्यूचर और अनसर्टेंटी उसका जो डर था उस डर को वो कम करने के लिए वो खुदा की तरफ मुड़ गया तो बात फिलोसफर्स कहते हैं इंसानों ने खुदा को इन्वेंट किया नौजबिल्ला खुदा को इसलिए इन्वेंट किया कि हमारी जो अनसर्टेंटीज है कि मौत के बाद क्या होगा कल क्या होगा दुनिया ने किसको बता किसने बनाया ये कैसी एग्जिस्टेंस में आ गई ये सारे फिलोसॉफिकल क्वेश्चंस के जो हमारे पास ना साइंस जवाब दे सकता है ना हमारे पास कोई जवाब है ये सिर्फ हमको मजहब से आता है तो मेरी नज मेरे ख्याल में इंसान ने मजहब को पहले पाया और धीरे धीरे जिस तरह से वो नियमों के साथ जीने लगा कल्चर पैदा हुआ तो कल्चर इज ए प्रोडक्ट ऑफ रिलीजियस लाइफ अब बाद में जाके यूरोप में जब एनलाइटनमेंट हुआ तो हम एक किस्म का सेक्युलर कल्चर पैदा करने की कोशिश की यूरोप ने भी अभी भी सेक्युलर नहीं है अभी भी क्रिसमस मनाते हैं अभी भी वैसे ही क्रिश्चियन फेस्टिवल्स मनाते हैं ये और बात है कि रिलीजियोसिटी कम हो गई है लेकिन जो कल्चर में मजहब का रोल है वो ख़त्म नहीं हुआ है आपका जो दूसरा सवाल है वो बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग है आप एक पूछ रहे हैं कि बेसिकली रिलीजन बेस्ड मॉडल्स क्या अच्छे हैं और एग्जांपल तो उदाहरण सिर्फ इस्लामिक मुल्कों का दिया है दैट इज़ आल्सो इंटरेस्टिंग आप देखते हैं कि बुद्धि बुद्ध बुद्धिज्म का भी असर श्रीलंका और म्यांमार में है क्या वो अच्छे मॉडल्स हैं क्रिश्चियनिटी का भी असर कई मुल्कों में है बास कहते हैं कि पुतिन का जो ये करंट कैंपेन है वो भी ऑर्थोडॉक्स क्रिश्चियनिटी से मोटिवेटेड है बट लेकिन अगर आप इस्लामिक एग्जाम्पल्स को देखें जहाँ जहाँ सो कॉल्ड इस्लामिक हुकूमतें हैं अफगानिस्तान तालिबान के अंदर ईरान इस्लामिक रेवोल्यूशन के बाद गाजा हमास के अंदर ये सारे मुल्कों में लोग बहुत मुश्किल से रहते हैं उनके ऊपर बहुत अजाबें होती है या तो दुश्मन उन पर हमला करते हैं या खुद उनकी गवर्नमेंट खुद अपनी ही आवाम पे जुल्म कर रही है तो मुझे साफ लगता है कि जिन सोसाइटीज पे रिलीजन को ऊपर से ढकेला जाता है वो सोसाइटीज आर नॉट गोइंग टू बी हैप्पी ना वो तरक्की करेंगे ना उनके आवाम खुश रहेंगे जिस तरह ईरान में प्रोटेस्ट चल रहे हैं वैसे प्रोटेस्ट चलते ही रहेंगे और जो सोसाइटी सेक्युलर हैं वो उसका मतलब ज़रूरी नहीं है कि वो डिवेलप्ड हों मुझे लगता है कि वो सोसाइटीज़ जहाँ पर लोगों को आज़ादी हो मजहब की भी आज़ादी हो और संस्कृति की भी आज़ादी हो और इकतसादी यानी इकनॉमिक इंडिपेंडेंस और फ्रीडम भी हो तो वहाँ पे इंसान तरक्की कर सकता है मटेरियल तौर पर तरक्की कर सकता है स्पिरिचुअल तौर पर तरक्की कर सकता है कल्चरल तौर पर ऐसे माहौल में शायद इंसान सबसे ज़्यादा खुश हो खुश रह सकता है और शायद ये ही सिस्टम 
میری نظر میں بہتر ہے میں مجھے امریکہ میں یہ ساری چیزیں حاصل ہیں میں انٹلیکچولی جو چاہے وہ کر سکتا ہوں اسپریچولی بھی میں جب چاہتا ہوں میں مسجد میں خطبے بھی دیتا ہوں میں صوفیزم پہ لیکچرز بھی دیتا ہوں میں نے ایک خطبہ دیا تھا جس میں میں نے سارا کا سارا خطبہ دھرم راج کے بارے میں تھا اور وہ وہ خطبے میں میں نے بتایا تھا کہ جس طرح سے دھرم راج نے آدھا جھوٹ بولا تھا کہ ابھی منیو کے نام کا ہاتھی مر گیا اور انہوں نے بیسکلی درونا چاریا کو یہ کنوے کیا کہ ابھی منیو ان کا بیٹا مر گیا تو ان کی رتھ جو تھی وہ ہوا سے زمین پر پر آ گئی تو ریلیجیس ویلیوز کی آزادی ہونا چاہیے آدمی کو بولنے کی یہ شاید میں کسی ملک مسلم ملک میں نہ کہہ سکوں لیکن امریکہ میں اس طرح کے بھی خطبے دیتا ہوں میں چرچس میں جا کے اسلامی خطبے دیتا ہوں تو میرے خیال سے وہ سسٹمز جہاں پر انسان کو آزادی ہو اور حفاظت ہو دیٹ از پروٹیکٹڈ بائی دا اسٹیٹ اینڈ ہی ہیز فریڈمس وہاں پہ انسان بیسٹ خوش رہے گا اور آپ کا جو دوسرا سوال ہے کیا یہی ماننا اچت ہے کہ پشچم کا ادھار سنسکرتی ہی ایک ماتر طریقہ ہے کسی دیش کی صدیوں تک بنے رہنے کے لیے بیسکلی اس سوال کا سمپل سوال ہے از ویسٹ دا فیوچر آف آل سکسیزفل نان ویسٹرن کنٹریز تو یہ سوال تو ماڈرنائزیشن کی وجہ سے ہوا تھا پوسٹ کالونیل سوسائٹیز میں جب یہ آزاد ہوئی تو پتہ چلا کہ ویسٹ ایڈوانس ہو گئی تھی اور ہم بیک ورڈ رہ گئے تھے ان کے پاس دولت تھی ان کے پاس ٹیکنالوجی تھی ان کے پاس ایجوکیشن تھا اور ان کے پاس ڈیموکریسی تھی اور یہ پوسٹ کالونیل سوسائٹیز جو انڈر ڈیولپ تھے ان کے پاس یہ ساری چیزیں نہیں تھیں تو ایک قسم سے تھیریز بنے کہ ان ملکوں کو چاہیے کہ وہ ماڈرنائز ہو جائے ماڈرنائز ہو جائیں انڈسٹریلائز ہو جائیں ایجوکیشن ہو جائیں میں یہاں شکاگو آیا ہوا ہوں میں شکاگو میں کل سر سید احمد خان کا ڈے سیلیبریشن کا کی نوٹ ایڈریس دے رہا ہوں اور اٹ از اباؤٹ دس سر سید احمد نے دیکھا کہ مسلمان پیچھے رہ گئے تھے اس لیے علی گڑھ مسلم یونیورسٹی بنائی تاکہ وہ ماڈرنائز ہو جائیں اور یہ سوال ہر سوسائٹی میں جاپان میں بھی کافی سوال اٹھے تھے کہ ہاؤ ٹو ماڈرنائز وتھ آؤٹ ویسٹرنائزنگ یعنی ویسٹ ماڈرنٹی کے جو چیزیں ہیں جیسے ایڈوانس ٹیکنالوجی سائنس وغیرہ اسے کیسا حاصل کریں وتھ آؤٹ بیکمنگ ویسٹرن ان کلچر ایران میں ایک شریعتی نام کے ایک تھنکر تھے انہوں نے کہا تھا کہ ہماری سوسائٹیز ویکسٹاکسیکیٹڈ ہوتی جا رہی ہیں یعنی ویسٹرن کلچر کے نشے میں بھائی آپ کو ریپ کرنا ضروری نہیں ہے آپ کو بیس بال کھیلنا کوک پینا پیتا کھانا یہ سب چیزوں کی ضرورت نہیں ہے لیکن آپ کو ٹیکنالوجی سائنس اس کی ضرورت ہے ماڈرن میتھڈز آف گورننس ڈیموکریسی تو مجھے لگتا نہیں کہ ویسٹ کی طرح اکنامکلی اور ٹیکنالوجیکلی ایڈوانس ہونے کے لیے کسی ملک کو اپنے سنسکرتی اپنے سنسکار کو چھوڑنے کی ضرورت ہے کنٹریز کین ماڈرنائز وتھ آؤٹ ویسٹرنائزنگ اور جاپان ایک بہت ہی اچھا مثال ہے اس کا شکریہ انکی صاحب بہت بہت آپ کے اور بھی دو تین سوال تھے میں انشاءاللہ کوشش کروں گا کہ اس کو بھی فیوچر ایپیسوڈز میں آنسر کروں تو آخری سوال سورب یادو کے پاس سے ہے سورب یادو کہتے ہیں ریسنٹلی واچ یور ویڈیو وتھ آرزو کازمی آن ایجوکیشن سسٹم ان وچ یو ہیو اسٹارٹیڈ ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ برہمنکل ایجوکیشنل سپیریورٹی ان کریکنگ گورنمنٹ ایگزام سچ ایز آئی ایس and is generations based but due to intervention this talk gets this talk got disturbed actually can you please brief me on this topic it will be very kind of you very hopeful for your answer so thank you for asking this question yes uh, i got a lot of comments in social media uh, where people were kind of unhappy that uh, we got sidetracked also and i when and then we started talking about something else so what i was and some people also pointed out that the largest number of is office or uh, successful is uh, candidates come f- not necessarily from the brahminical uh, community they come from bihar and they are not brahmins but when i went to look at the data the data shows that uh, brahmins are disproportionately represented uh, not just in the ias but also in iits and iims etc 
So what is the reason for it? Uh, my son, who uh, just graduated from Harvard University, is interested in Chinese studies and he's an economist. And what he was telling me the other day was that uh, about a thousand or more years ago, one particular province of China, which had many uh, Shaolin temples and Shaolin mon uh, academies, and for some reason they were not getting that in one particular year because of war or something some of the members of the elite society or the brahmins of china were not available to be recruited for that academy so they wanted to recruit ordinary people the peasants basically so they wanted to bring in children of the peasants into the academy uh, and they didn't know what to do so somebody came up with the idea of having an entrance exam they said look if you're going to go to people with quote unquote lower social status, then we should at least pick the brightest of them. So, so they, the Chinese actually invented the aptitude test, which would test who were uh, smart, intelligent, and also would make up become great monks and have this potential to be religious scholars. Uh, and they were very successful with that experiment, and so they continued for several years. But my son's finding, the most interesting finding is that even today, the children of that province outperform uh, the, the students from other provinces in all entrance exam exams in China, as well as those such as GRE, SATs, uh, GMAT, etc. So basically, the point he's trying to make is that there is a historical memory and, and a culture of excelling in education, giving importance to education, uh, which is inherited and it helps you in doing well. Let me share you my own personal example. When I was in my third year engineering, so a fourth year engineering, first semester, so basically around December is when you start taking all your exams, SATs, GREs, uh, the CAT exam, entrance to IIMs, etc. So I was an above average smart kid uh, and uh, a friend of mine said, so what do you want to do after finishing your engineering? I said, I want to do an MBA. And he said, so you're taking uh, CAT, you're taking the IM entrance in the next few months. And believe me, I didn't know about IIM entrance exams and how to go about it. I hadn't thought of it. There was nobody in my house who talked about IIM. Nobody knew these things. I never knew anybody until I met this person who is actually a very good friend of mine. His name is Hussein. So until Hussein told me about IIMs, Hussein was a graduate of IIM Bangalore, but until he told me that, I had never heard of it. But Hussein's younger brother went to IIM Cal and he had heard about it from his elder brother. So in the family it runs. So, so if I was in India right now, my children would have heard about entrance exams for Calcutta, IIM, uh, IIMs and this and that. Uh, from their childhood, you know, and my son used to tell me in 6th, 7th grade that he's going to beat uh, the score that I got in my GRE exam. So this culture of focusing on education, the culture of focusing on competitive exams, that is inherited. So, so if you look at people who have, uh, especially the Brahmins who are in civil services, you'll find their parents also were, and their grandparents also were, maybe they were also professors. So there is a history of academic excellence which goes on and on and on. And I'm not saying that there's a superior DNA or anything, I'm just saying it's a cultural experience. So I, I hope I've not uh, created some kind of a caste uh, controversy, that is not my goal. Uh, my purpose was very simple to say that if you have this culture of uh, parents, relatives, etc., uh, concentrating on on education. My uncle used to read a lot of books, and he had lots of books. But he read novels, English novels, Western novels, James Hadley Chase, and this and that. So I got into the habit of reading. But I wish he had better books. I wish he had philosophy books. I wish he had history books. I wish he had books about culture. So the books that I would have read uh, because of him uh, would have made me a much better thinker, more knowledgeable about things. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I'm happy that I got the habit of reading uh, from, uh, from him, uh, but uh, I would have 
been a better read person if instead of reading hundreds and hundreds of uh, novels I had read books on history philosophy and culture so 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 those who are intellectual elites in every society tend to achieve that and this is not just rem limited to the Hindu culture we have that same thing here uh, in uh, university here in the US uh, where um, certain communities are focused on ac academic excellence while others might be focused on entrepreneurship etc or going into the military but uh, some communities are focused on academic excellence and you will see more and more people from that community uh, benefiting from this culture of their community and so doing well excellence so which means that uh, whether your parents were focused on education or not you should focus on education when you have children make sure that you watch good programs on television on youtube watch conversations on youtube get your kids to to watch it too and read books have lots and lots of books all over the home um, here uh, you can go every week to the library and check out 100 books uh, for your kids small books that you can read in like five minutes ten minutes so read a lot to your children and develop this desire to excel academically even if you're very rich even if you're Adani let your children be intellectually sharp let the money be in the banks uh, but focus on education I think education is the best investment for an individual for a family for a country so it was fun reading your questions and answering them uh, I already I also already have about 10 12 more questions I will try and answer them subsequently as soon as I get back to Delaware if you notice I don't even have a good mic with uh, microphone with me so please bear if the recording is not as good as usual uh, but uh, please keep the questions coming and uh, it, it, it is uh, it will keep the dialogue going so thank you very much for watching and if you have not already subscribed to conversations what are you waiting for subscribe and uh, get your family members also to watch develop this desire for pursuit of uh, excellence in education uh, and i wish you all the best until next time this is muqtadar khan signing off